Mr. Robert Baker. Mr. Baker is a member of the Law Review at Seton Hall Law School and has written an article which will appear in the Law Review, which is one of the most definitive works on compulsory education laws in this country. The subject of Mr. Baker's speech will be the common law of a free society. In view of his talk yesterday, will the real Robert Baker please stand up? I, too, have an announcement. You're all under arrest. Can everyone hear me? No. Okay. A little better now? Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Not having learned my lesson yesterday, I have returned to the scene of the crime. Hopefully the thoughts I want to share with you today will while possibly less stimulating, uh, elicit fewer cries of outrage from the faithful. I expect to talk for about half an hour, and then I will bear my breast to your arrows. Before I begin, a word to any lawyers in the audience. I'm going to be discussing to a non-legal audience some matters that bear on what we know are technical aspects of the law. Now, if I oversimplify or even forget to mention the rule against perpetuities or uh, proximate causation, please, when I'm finished, don't take me up on it. Remember the nature of the audience I'm addressing. There's an unfortunate tendency among some libertarians to assume that once Leviathan is brought to heel by the power of sweet reason, rationality will gradually diffuse throughout the entire world, and the only thing that the peaceful citizens of this pleasant land will have to worry about in the future is a few random criminals who missed out on the general distribution of intelligence. In case there are any such wishful thinkers out there, get ready for a shock. Because comes the millennium, your dog is still going to tear up the neighbor's petunia patch. The television set that you bring home is still going to show nothing but snow, although it's brand new. And somebody is still going to smash your fender on the west side highway. As long as human beings live in society, they are going to be stepping on each other's toes once in a while. And as long as they are rational enough to appreciate the fact that it is in their self-interest, they are going to have some organized methods of dealing with and laying to rest the disputes that revolve around the inevitable frictions of societal living. It is these methods of doing something about these disputes that I'm concerned with today. Pardon me. When Mrs. Jones comes to your door bearing her mangled petunias, and demanding satisfaction, what do you do? Do you call the police? Well, of course not. Not in today's society and not in any conceivable future society. Disputes such as these are not susceptible to the intervention of men bearing guns and clubs. Chances are, in fact, that you and Mrs. Jones will come to an understanding. You will probably give her a sum of money or conceivably some petunias of equal value if you have them, thus restoring her to the status quo ante. If you are a person of foresight, you will also get a stout chain for your dog. But suppose that you and Mrs. Jones cannot come to an understanding. What then? If you live in any reasonably advanced society, and Mrs. Jones is sufficiently provoked by her loss, 
you will go to law. That is to say, Mrs. Jones, who has the beef, will attempt to have certain sanctions imposed upon you by a social institution which exists for that purpose, hoping that in order to avoid these sanctions, you will reconsider your position and compensate her to the extent she thinks proper. In today's American society, her recourse, obviously, is to some court of law, <clears throat> an arm of government, having, like all governmental institutions, certain powers, generally recognized as legitimate by most of the population, to enforce its decisions. If Mrs. Jones proves to the satisfaction of the court that you were responsible for her loss, the court will grant her a judgment, that is, a statement that she is entitled to a certain sum of money from you. Such a judgment is in our society universally recognized as a proper debt, and if you refuse to pay it, Mrs. Jones may then institute a further procedure at law whereby the velvet is stripped from the court's gloved fist, and an armed man, the sheriff, will eventually come and seize some of your property, selling it to pay Mrs. Jones' judgment. This conference is built around the theme of social change. Most of us here are working for and foresee a time when coercion will largely have been eliminated from our society. When that time comes, what will all the Mrs. Joneses of the world do about their petunia patches? I am not a prophet, but the godlike power that one gets when one stands up here has made me a little reckless, and I'm going to attempt some prophecy in this area. First of all, I want to make a guess as to the form that a free society, a libertarian society specifically, might take in regard to government. Many of you heard the debate yesterday. I haven't the foggiest notion whether or not in the future some resemblance to the monopoly government we see today will remain or not. I have the suspicion, in fact, that if we're lucky anyway, change will come relatively peacefully, and we will see a huge so-called private organization, together with several small ones, dominating the markets. That is to say, I expect to see what resembles a government today, having perhaps 80 or 90 percent of the market available, and uh, doing the job we want it to do, with smaller, perhaps, competing firms, much like exists today, except they don't do the job we want them to do. There is an assumption among many libertarians that there will be not merely competition, but hostility among the various governmental forms and organizations. I can see no reason to assume this. I think that even if it were to exist in the beginning, the various defense agencies, to coin a phrase, will find it in their self-interest to get along. We heard a great deal yesterday, and we hear constantly in discussions of this sort, about whether or not history is relevant. When discussing the common law, this is one area where it is extremely relevant. The state as we know it today, all pervasive and all powerful, did not always exist. There was a time when there were no courts of law, a time when the king's writ did not run. I want to take a look for a moment at what things were like then to give you an idea of what I suspect they may be like later on. <clears throat> In the year 1200, if I had a dispute at a fair with a merchant, what would we do? The king was in Westminster, perhaps hundreds of miles away. Neither one of us was very athletic, so we didn't want to get up on a horse and use our lances, and murder was frowned upon then just as it is today. What we did was to go to what was known as a pea powder court, a fair court. This information, incidentally, will be found in a 
recent work, which I recommend to you highly, all the note takers. <laughs> the book is entitled Uncle Sam the Monopoly Man. This is a free commercial for a gentleman I've never met. His name is Wooldridge. And in chapter 9 of that book, he mentions a great deal of what I'm saying here. To return to our fair court. These courts had none of the power that today's courts have to send a sheriff to come take your property, yet they were universally respected. They were respected because the sanction they had was a lot more effective than the sheriff's. I'll describe those sanctions in a little while. What I mean by the common law is that law which is developed from case to case by judges. It got to be called the common law in our jurisprudential tradition because it was common to the king's entire realm, as distinguished from the individual law which might have prevailed in Wessex or Sussex or any other of the small towns in the country. It can be contrasted to the civil law, the civil law has nothing to do purely with disputes over torts or contracts. Rather, it derives from what is known as the jus civili, the Roman law. The Romans attempted, and to some degree succeeded, in codifying, that is, in laying down rules beforehand which would govern all human behavior. The arrogance of such an attempt is, is truly astonishing today, because imagine yourself trying to predict all the myriad actions that human beings could take. They tried it. The civil law still prevails throughout most of the continent of Europe, in South America, and in certain parts of the Near East. The other alternative adopted by the English judges was to de decide cases on a case-by-case -case basis. The decisions of these judges, and we have them in libraries running back to about 1145, were collected, studied by legal scholars, and formed a basis, a body of law for us. In the libertarian society, I would expect to see something like this continue. It is not rational to expect that with the elimination of coercive government we are going to toss out 800 years of experience. There will, however, be some changes. First of all, in a rational society, the amount of court work will decline enormously. Not because I expect people to get any smarter, but because there are going to be very much fewer crimes. Today it is, well, you know the old saying, you can't spit on the sidewalk. Maybe you couldn't in a rational society either. But you could in a rational society, if you wish to, uh, pump yourself full of narcotics and uh, make love in any manner you pleased, which you cannot do so today. Consequently, I would expect that except for those crimes which consist of direct assault upon people's rights, that is, crimes with a victim, the criminal law would be reduced enormously. I have it on good authority from a friend of mine, as a criminal lawyer, that about 90% of the crime now being processed in the courts of this state, of the city rather, consists of narcotics offenses. All of this would go in a free society. And I would recommend to any of you who are criminal lawyers, if you see the free society coming, uh, practice up on your contract writing and your will drawing or you're going to starve. <laughs> There's been a resurgence in our generation of a previously discredited or to some extent discredited theory known as natural law. Natural law perhaps rose to its zenith with the work of St. Thomas Aquinas in the uh, St. Thomas Aquinas in the thirteenth century. 
Because of various silly uses of it over the years, it began to be regarded as uh, intellectually barren. Since the Nuremberg trials in Germany, we have seen it rise again. People mean many things by natural law. When I use the expression, I, I generally think of those rules of human conduct in a society which can be derived from the nature of human beings. It is perfectly obvious to me, at least, that we need no statute forbidding me to poke you in the nose. By your nature as a human being, you have a right not to be poked in the nose. Unfortunately, it was once thought that the natural law uh, pronounced a theory concerning which side of the road you should drive on, and all the English judges were convinced that the left side was God's law. The Americans had some quarrel about that. Now, that sort of silliness, which I'm, certainly, I'm not joking there, this sort of thing was actually done, that sort of silliness does tend to discredit any kind of theory. What the English judges of years ago missed, and what I think we realize today, is that while the natural law does not tell you what side of the road you shall drive upon, it does tell you that you must make a consistent choice in that matter. There are certain things that the natural law can tell us, like you shouldn't be punched in the nose, and certain things that it can't. I certainly know of no way for the natural law to tell me at what instant a contract comes into existence. I'm thinking of a specific example. Many years ago in England, there was a famous case, Adams versus Linzel, in which a contract was entered into by mail. And the question arose, because the contract was allegedly breached, did the contract come into existence at the moment that the acceptance of the offer was posted, or did it come into existence upon receipt? Well, if you can figure out how to divine the answer to that from natural law, you have more imagination than I do. But a judge cannot duck such an issue. Whatever he does, he's got to do something. So the judges did something. And uh, I hope I remember correctly, they decided that uh, the, the acceptance takes place at the moment of posting. Now, I don't want to sound cynical in what I say here, but this is a principle of law that will continue in a rational society. It is frequently better that a principle of law be decided than that it be decided right. It may be that we could debate for the next few weeks on what the natural law says, if it says anything, about when contracts are formed. Maybe you convince me that you're correct. What the next generation would do, I don't know. But we cannot live commercial life, surely, with a continuing debate on which is the right rule under natural law. We must have a rule that everyone knows about, that applies to every contract made, and we can then base our actions upon it. The sole exception to my contention that it is better for things to be settled than to be settled right, of course, is in the area of criminal law, which I am largely ignoring in what I have to say today. There we will accept, to the extent that we're able to do it, only perfect justice. But do not expect that even in the most rational society, you will see perfect justice. Rationality does not imply infallibility. Because of this importance of settling things, and settling them once and for all, right or wrong, in areas of the civil law, a rational society will continue to adhere to a doctrine which permeates all of Anglo-American law known as stare decisis. Once a decision has been made in a certain type of case, if that type of case comes up again, we're going to make the same decision. 
You might think this would make the law inflexible, and to some extent I, I must admit that it does once in a while, but the judges are not fools. Let me give you an example by returning to more poor Mrs. Jones's tattered petunias. If in a rational society she goes to law to sue you for her petunias that your dog has dug up, the court is not going to decide the case out of the clear blue sky. The, law, the judge is going to go to the law books, which will still exist, and find out have cases like this occurred before. Well, it turns out that, believe it or not, no dog has ever dug up any petunias before, but we did have a pig dig up some petunias. What's the judge going to do? Well, I, I don't know, but uh, that's how lawyers make their money, is guessing what judges are going to do, but he's probably going to rule the same way, substituting the dog for the pig. Today, if any of you walk into a law library, such as the one that's in this building, you will see row upon row of books. Some of these are statute books, others are form books, but a great many of them are what we call the reports. They are nothing but the reports of cases that have been decided. They are the raw material of the Anglo-American lawyer. It is from them that he decides what the law is. There's a common misconception that the law in this state is something laid down up in Albany. Well, that misconception may be gradually coming true, as a matter of fact, as we get inundated with statutes. But as of right now, it is not true. The overwhelming body of the law that most of you will ever be concerned with is law which has been decided by judges. In the rational society, I would expect to see the rule of stare decisis to continue. I would also expect to see at least as much uniformity among the various geographical areas of the country as we see today. If you want to get a, let's say, a divorce, which is an area that some people are familiar with, in the state of New York, you will find that you are operating under a different law than you are operating, say, in the state of Arkansas or California. Such matters as marriage and divorce are regulated by the laws of the individual states. Yet we do not see, contrary to some predictions of the future, the police of state A shooting over the border into the police of state B. Now, we, don't, we just don't observe this. That is to say, the courts of the several states have found out that that doesn't work. It doesn't work in today's society, and it won't work in the future. What will probably happen, and this is merely an educated or semi-educated guess, is that the various courts which exist, whether they resemble today's arbitration panels or not, will get together in judicial conferences and say, well now look, throughout this jurisdiction we've been deciding these petunium battering cases in a certain fashion. And in order to avoid what is known as forum shopping, let's agree among ourselves that we will not deviate from this in any future petunia battering case. There is an institute today, consisting primarily of lawyers and a few judges, known as the American Law Institute, which has a committee on uniform state laws. This arose because the judges and the lawyers found it in their self-interest to have the law as uniform as it could be. I assume that lawyers and judges in the future will still act in their self-interest. To give you an example of how this occurs, we have in most states today, I think it is now all 50, what is known as the Uniform Commercial Code a course which any of you who are student lawyers will soon have to struggle through. 
This was proposed by the Institute on Uniform Laws and has been established throughout the country so that a contract made in one place, say New York, can be interpreted under the same rules there as it might be in the state of California. This can be done. It can be done a lot easier in a rational society, and I think it will be done. In the past, there have been a great many voluntary courts. What you may not be aware of is that today there are a great many voluntary courts. In fact, the volume of litigation that passes through arbitration proceedings or religious courts today in this country probably exceeds by a factor of four or five all that going into our clogged courts. Give you an example. The American Arbitration uh, Society last year, I'm sorry, 1968, processed 24,000 claims. The American Insurance Institute processes every year in excess of 50,000 insurance claims that never get near the courts. This development of parallel alternative systems I expect to continue to grow. Hopefully, when a free society comes about and it brings with it a free court system, it will do so not because we overthrew the present coercive court system, but because we rendered it irrelevant. That might be a good place to stop. <laughs> a few moments more that I want to discuss the questions of procedures uh, in future courts. When Mrs. Jones uh, comes upon you with her mangled petunias, she's going to have to go into this court of law. She's going to have to convince a judge, even in a rational society, that, first of all, she has suffered some damage. She valued these petunias. She's going to have to show that you are responsible for the damage and that you are responsible in such a manner that under the rules of uh, law, you should recompense her. This is true in any legal organization. It's true, for example, in the Russian Empire today. It was true in Nazi Germany. In 1943, in Nazi Germany, you could get justice on a case like this in a court of law of that vicious state. She's going to have to do so in a certain form and manner that's going to be uniform for everybody. This, too, will continue in a rational, freedom-loving society. The plaintiff is going to have to go in and establish his case. He's not going to have policemen to help him. He's going to have to convince the judge. Frequently, libertarians overemphasize, in my point, from my point of view, the effect of contract in a free society. Now, it's true that great legal scholars like Sir Henry Maine have pointed out that the, the history of English liberty is the story of moving from a society of status to a society of contracts. But let us not ask contracts to do what they can't. If I walk into the store to buy some bubble gum, and I pick up the bubble gum, have I made a contract? Well, I have in today's society, and I have in a rational society, too. Do not expect that every commercial transaction that you take part in when the millennium comes is going to be accompanied by a piece of paper. It is not. The courts are going to continue to interpret the making of non-written contracts as they always have in the past. Will there be any areas of what we call the substantive law which will change? I think so. One of them is particularly in what used to be called domestic relations, and I guess in the more modern teaching now is family law. In our society, marriage is status. 
for any attorneys in the audience who might dispute that because the courts do sometimes, I refer you to Maynard versus Hill in 1885. We can expect this sort of thing to change. We can expect to see true contract come into the law of family relations, particularly in regard to children. The courts, I expect, will recognize under natural law, that those who create a child by their own free will have an obligation to care for it. I would not be at all surprised to see some uniform system of compulsory education. I don't know how it would be enforced, but I think it would be possible in a rational society. This sort of change, contracts in the case of family relations, I believe will come about. How will the courts be supported? Well, since they will resemble to a large extent the courts of pea powder of several centuries ago, or today's arbitration proceedings, I assume they will be supported the same way. Under the law merchant, for example, in the 14th and 15th centuries, when people sued each other for money damages, the court's fee was usually nothing more than one-twelfth of the matter in dispute. This avoided any appearance of the court having an interest in the litigation, since the judge got his fee no matter how the case went, and uh, thus he had no interest in increasing the damages. The genius of the common law lies in the fact that it goes from case to case, building on experience and taking into account the realities of everyday life, rather than attempting to make a priori abstractions about the way human beings will behave. For that reason, I expect to see it continue and to grow in its reasonableness.